Welcome back as we try to finish up this semester's teaching on the issue of biblical leadership. We're now into the home stretch and I believe we can see the finish line. I want to thank you. I'm extremely uh, grateful for your patience and your endurance and your perseverance as you have lasted through all these many, many weeks of the teaching on the issue of biblical leadership. Let's try to finish this up here today, and we're looking at this issue of who these people were in the life of the Apostle Paul. And the question that we dealt with was, you know, how do you measure success? And that's where we were. And what, we're done, what we have done is to split this in two categories, and that was to mention in the last days of the life of the Apostle Paul, we're looking at all those that were near and dear and precious to his heart. And in addition, he mentions all of those who caused him great suffering toward the end. Now, why does he mention these individuals? Because he has to warn the next tier of leadership, the next tier okay, of leadership, and this would be Timothy. He's going to pass the baton on. Remember that we're in 2 Timothy, and 2 Timothy is the last letter that the apostle writes as he goes to his death in Rome. And we're reminded of this issue as, and I won't repeat everything we did last week, you know, and what we did in all these previous classes. But here, let's kind of just try to tie all this together in this particular last session. The, I want to talk to you about the faint-hearted believers in Rome. The faint-hearted believers in Rome. There were many, many more who were faint-hearted. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, Paul describes how he was abandoned by everyone soon after his arrest. Note what it says in verse 16. At my first offense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. That was his prayer. He states, he makes a statement of fact. Not one person supported him because the saints were faint-hearted in Rome. They had more fear and they were afraid and they literally abandon him in the hour of need. Now we can piece together what, ha what apparently happened from the sparse details that the Apostle Paul gave. He was most, most likely tracked down and captured somewhere in the Roman Empire and likely far from Rome and then he was brought, he was brought to Rome of which we know that the Roman Empire had a habit of announcing once somebody had been captured to announce it to the empire to strike fear in the heart of men. Now let me make this statement to you quickly here. And I want to say, because I've made this statement numerous times and different types of teachings inside of the church, even where I pastor a church, as well as in, uh, diff overseas in the different places that I've been in, that I've visited to teach and preach the gospel, as well as to train pastors. Let me make this statement, and I want to make it emphatically, and at first it's kind of a shocker when I make that statement. Any pastor, any pastor who trusts his congregation, okay, is a fool. Let me repeat that again. Any pastor who trusts his congregation is a fool. It's a phenomenon that does not exist, not even in nature. It is the responsibility of the shepherd okay, to protect the sheep. By, even by design, by natural divine sovereign design, the shepherd is designed to protect the sheep, not the sheep, the shepherd. And sheep will paralyze. They will literally paralyze. I, I, I saw this in Eastern Europe. I was teaching at a pastor's conference. And I was teaching, and this particular conference area had these very, very large windows, and I could see out to the pasture. And here was, and here I was teaching out of the book of Timothy, when a pastor, literally a shepherd, is coming down the hill with his sheep. And so I asked, I interrupted my own teaching, and I said, run out there and ask the pastor if we can ask him some questions. And, and, and um, sure enough, and he waved all the way back, and the pastor said yes, the shepherd said yes. And so I, I, had, all, I had all the pastors come out with me, and we went outside and we were having this long conversation with the shepherd about the nature of sheep about the nature of sheep and he says sheep are so scared they'd be paralyzed and then he demonstrated and he turned around he scared the sheep and they literally came stiff as a board and fell down 
Literally. They just faint it. And the reason I asked them to do that was because I wanted to prove my point to the shepherds, all of the pastors that I was training. Sheep will not defend you. They will run for their lives. So any pastor who depends, any pastor who trusts his sheep is a fool. And Paul clearly makes that statement here, not as Christ and not as crude as I would, of course not. But he makes the, he makes the statement very clear that can be no misunderstanding here. He says it very clear in 2 Timothy 4.16. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Listen, you love your sheep. You pray for your sheep. You protect your sheep. You do everything. You feed the sheep. You do everything. But don't depend and don't trust them to follow through in times of danger. You will be abandoned. Sadly to state, the history of the church is filled with that type of testimony hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times over and over and over again. Now Paul may well have been singled out by Nero personally because he had already appeared before the emperor and he was well known as a leader of the church. When Nero began to persecute Christians, he would have specifically targeted Paul. He's going to go after the head. That's the whole idea is to go after the head of the church. If you kill the head, you kill the church. That's the basic understanding. And we've seen this in country after country after country. If you kill the pastor, you kill the church. You kill the church, you weaken the community. That's the mentality that has always existed. Now, once arrested, Paul would immediately have been transported to Rome for trial. This time, Luke probably would not have been permitted to accompany him, and the physician would have to arrange his own travel and arrive later in Rome. And as soon as Paul reached Rome, he would have been arraigned. The Roman court system demanded that he be given an opportunity to defend himself at the initial hearing. This is most likely what he, when, what he was describing when he said, my first defense that's what he's describing when he says here in verse 16, at my first defense, this is what he's talking about, at the initial hearing. It apparently occurred before Luke and Onesiphorus, no, these were his two friends, and it, because they were present here. And we know that because in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 16, the word of God says, The Lord grant mercy to the, to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my ch chains. <laughs> and so these were the companions that were always with Paul as he went, to, and, and, when he, and clearly when he was able to reach Rome. But the church of Rome was filled, it was filled with believers who knew Paul well. Paul probably anticipated that some of them would testify on his behalf or at least show up at the trial for moral support, but no one did. Not one single person wanted to be found identified with him public. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10 tells us, For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescent has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Now he says, all deserted me. He used the same verb here to speak of Demas' defection. It's, it's the exact same phrase, the same word that he's using here in the Greek language. They left him in the lurch. They left him in the out to dry. Uh, they abandoned him in his hour of need. They abandoned him at a crucial time. They were no doubt embarrassed or they were afraid to be identified with Paul because of the persecution. Such deliberate neglect of the great apostle who had given so much for them was completely unthinkable but it does happen. In 2 Timothy 4.16, again, I want you to note this at the end of that verse where he says, may it not be counted against them. Notice Paul's prayer. He had a prayer for them. May it not be charged against them for having abandoned him. This makes a stark contrast with his words about Alexander, if you remember that. That's because Alexander's treachery was, get, was driven by evil motives, and the people who were no-shows at Paul's defense were most likely driven by their own fears and their own frailty. They were faint-hearted, not false-hearted. Listen to me carefully. That's why I tell you all the time, 
A pastor who depends upon the congregation, who trusts the congregation in the hour of persecution, in the hour of need, okay, is a fool. Your people are not false hearted. They just simply are faint hearted. And you need to understand that as a reality in the life of sheep. That's a reality. And yet Paul prayed for them and said, please, God, don't count this against them. Paul's wish for them is reminiscent of even, if you recall, Stephen in the book of Acts in chapter 7, who said of those who were stoning him to death in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, then falling on his knees, talking about Stephen, he cried out with a loud voice, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he died. And it reflects also the spirit of Christ, whom from the cross he prayed this in Luke tw chapter 23 and verse 34. In Luke 23, 34, when he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And you need to comprehend that this is a reality. I want to talk to you about the triumph that he obtained, the triumph of Paul, the triumph that Paul obtained, abandoned by his friends, hated by his enemies, Paul might have felt like giving up in despair. But instead, this is what he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. Notice this in 17 and 18. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice this. Christ had made a promise. You remember in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Remember that statement? Indeed, when everyone else forsook the apostle Paul, Christ stood by him. Again, in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said this. I will never desert you. I will never forsake you, nor will I ever forsake you or ever leave you. Paul would have been on trial in a large basilica, teeming with the hostile people all present, packed in shoulder to shoulder, wanting to see what's going to happen. Nero himself may have overseen. It's a possibility that Nero himself had overseen the proceedings, considering the importance of the prisoner. There Paul stood without an advocate, without a defense attorney, without any witnesses on his behalf, and with no one to defend him. Many a pastor has found himself in this situation. He was absolutely alone and helpless in front of an imperial court that from the human point of view held his life in their hands. But the Lord stood with him, strengthening him. And the Greek verb for strengthen speaks of an infusion of power that comes only from God. The Paul began to feel Christ's empowerment in his spirit, enabling him to be the human instrument through which the gospel was fully preached so the Gentiles might hear at his last hearing. That moment was, in effect, the pinnacle. This was the pinnacle of Paul's ministry and the fulfillment of his deepest desire. He was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Rome was the cosmopolitan center of the pagan world. And you have to understand, Paul had all always wanted to go there to finally preach the gospel. Paul had long sought an opportunity to preach the gospel in such a venue before the world's most important political leaders and philosophical trendsetters. That's what he wanted to do. This was, not, this was that opportunity. In the midst of it, Paul was strengthened by the Spirit of Christ to speak boldly and thoroughly. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17, again I call your attention to that verse. Notice what he says at the very end of that verse. I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. He wrote this. That's probably a figurative language. And we know that because he, was, he had a habit of doing that by quoting the Old Testament. In this case, using Psalm chapter 22, verse 21, and Psalm chapter 35, verse 17. Meaning that he was speaking. 
spared, meaning that he was spared immediate execution just for the moment. That's what he was talking about. God delivered him from the perilous tribunal and, the, and it turned into an opportunity to preach a strategic gospel message in that moment. And Paul is using this language out of the book of Psalm. Again, Psalm chapter 22, verse 21 says, Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen, you answered me. In Psalm 35, in verse 17, it says this, How long, how long will you look on, rescue my soul from their ravages, for all, my only life from the lions? But it didn't end his imprisonment or permanently end the danger of Paul's life at that moment. He would eventually be executed, and he knew that. That was no secret. But notice that even while acknowledging his death was imminent, the Apostle Paul could write this truth in verse 18, 2 Timothy 4, 18, when he said this, the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for the heavenly kingdom. He made that statement loud and clear. The deliverance he sought was an eternal reality, not a rescue from the temporal or the earthly tri tribulations. When Paul, when Paul a thought of the certainty of that deliverance, he could not resist and 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 express this and have this 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 glad expression, this happy expression, this joyful expression of worship. When he said to him at the end of verse 18 in 2 Timothy chapter 4, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This was authentic triumph that in his hour of death, he can say to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And Paul could enjoy it fully despite his circumstances in his last hour. Finally, Paul closed both the epistle and the final chapter of his life with some assorted greetings to old friends, news about, the key, about key ministry partners, and greetings from the select people in the church of Rome. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read on in verse 19, 20, 21, and 22. Note what it says here. He says this very clearly. He says, Greet Prisca and uh, Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus, I left sick Amiletus, uh, Amiletus and make every effort to come before winter. Eubelus, greet him, and also Pudens and Linus and Claudius and all uh, the brethren. And the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. These are the final words that he writes and notice what he mentions here he mentions he takes time notice the remaining names of the people who also were part of Paul's extended network in this team that he had built so successfully he names Priscilla and Aquila here okay? Priscilla and Aquila are familiar to us they were the couple who worked with Paul if you recall this in the tent making trade business during his first visit to Corinth you see that clearly in the book of Acts in chapter 18 and verse 2 and 3 that's very clearly who they were they left Corinth and with Paul and traveled with him to Ephesus you remember that in Acts chapter 18 verse 18 and 19 they also traveled with Paul as well having learned so much from Paul they patiently taught Apollos notice how Paul invested his life in the life of, of Priscilla and Aquila and then they turned around and invested their lives in the life of Apollos notice this in Acts chapter 18 verse 26 and he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue talking about Apollos but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. The ministry of Paul was now flourishing through the lives of other people as he's pre preparing to depart this earth, depart this world. He's now leaving a legacy of people who have been equipped in the ministry. Thus Paul's influence extended to Apollos through the ministry of this couple. They were the instruments God used to help bring Apollos to maturity. That's very important. And Apollos became a powerful extension of Paul's ministry and leadership after the death of this great apostle. So when Paul wrote, about, wrote Romans about six years later, Aquila and Priscilla were living in Rome at this point in time. As he writes this now, Aquila and Priscilla are now living. They're now living in Rome. We know this because in Romans chapter 16 and verse 23, it says this, Gaius, host to me, and the whole church greets you. Erastus, the city treasure, greets you. And he says, 
and, 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 and the quarters of the brothers. Okay? And so we know that, that, that that's at the end of Romans chapter 16. But then at the beginning of Romans chapter 16, he says this in verse 3, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Why? Because they were already in Rome. That's the reason why. They were already in Rome. And apparently, they apparently left Rome during the brutal persecution of the Jews carried out by the Emperor Claudius. From there, they went back to Ephesus and hosted the Ephesian, uh, the Ephesian church in their house. Because that when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus, he sent greetings to old friends in Corinth on behalf of Aquila and Priscilla. So now, notice that these people traveled all over the known world with, Paul, with, with, with the Apostle Paul. They went from place to place in the work of the ministry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we're told in verse 19, the churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily, and the Lord with the church that is in their house. So he was writing this from Ephesus. So this was a couple that had traveled and traveled extensively with Paul for many years. They were old friends and longtime fellow workers. Paul sent them the greeting. And then Paul takes time to mention the household of Onesiphorus. Now, Onesiphorus may have been in Rome with Paul when Paul sent greetings back to his household in Ephesus. Because in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17, Paul mentioned that Onesiphorus had frequently refreshed him without being ashamed of Paul's imprisonment. Notice that he takes time to mention him and in the annals of the history that will remain here eternally mentioned in the word of God. In 2 Timothy 1, 16, 1, 16 and 17, the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Notice what he says. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched me and found me. He was not ashamed to be identified with the Apostle Paul even at the peril of his own life. Moreover, when, es when Onesiphorus had first come to Rome, he zealously sought Paul out. He arrived apparently soon after that bitter experience at Paul's trial when no one had stood with him. So Paul was obviously extremely and very grateful for Onesiphorus' singular kindness to him. And then he mentions Erastus. And the reason we take time as we're coming to the end of this is because there's a lot of people like this in your churches, a lot of people like this in your ministry. Do not forget who they are. They have stood with you. They worked in the shadows of your ministry and they have supported you and loved you and prayed for you. Erastus, you remember him. Paul then reported that Erastus stayed at Corinth. You remember that? In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 20 where he says Erastus remained at Corinth. Well, this is most likely the same Erastus who mentioned, remember in the book of Acts in chapter 19 in verse 22 who had ministered alongside Timothy in Macedonia. Uh, he says in Acts 19.22, And having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So you can see these are people who were near and dear and precious to his heart as, this, as the end of days were coming. He was, uh, he was another old friend, a longtime fellow worker with whom Paul still had a close connection. Now Erastus was apparently helping to lead the church in Corinth now. And Paul wanted Timothy to stay in contact with him. And then, and then we get to finally to Trophimus. And then, and Trophimus, and Trophimus, uh, next on Paul's list is another beloved old friend, and that's him. Accordingly, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 4, Paul mentions him. And as he was accompanied by a superstar of Berea and the son of Pyrrhus and Aristarchus and Secundus of the, of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. So now he's mentioning who all these people are who are now out and about in the work of the ministry who are with him. He also left his home in order to travel with Paul and work alongside the apostle. He had helped bring the Gentile offering to the poor Christian in Jerusalem. It was Trophimus who took the offering from Corinth and Macedonia and took it to the Jerusalem saints. Okay? On the way, he traveled through Troas with Paul and was there in, uh, with um, Ecutus who fell out of the window and was resurrected. Remember that? Paul was preaching. The guy fell out the window. He fell asleep. Okay? And when they arrived in Jerusalem, the Jews took notice of Trophimus because he was presumably a Gentile. 
And when they saw Paul in the temple, they wrongly assumed he had Trophimus with him inside of the temple. And that's what, that was the incident that led to Paul's first arrest. And it was because of his friend Trophimus who did nothing wrong. People just made a whole bunch of assumptions about him. In Acts 21, 29, it says, For they had previously seen Trophimus with the Ephesian in the city with him, and they supposed, they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. And this is what created the riot and which caused his first arrest. Now, Trophimus uh, was sick and Paul had left the Emiletus. He got sick and he left the Miletus to be attended to. He must have been rather seriously ill because Miletus is only about 36 miles away from Ephesus, but he must have been so sick that he just simply could not continue to travel. We can safely assume then that Paul would have healed him if possible. Now note this with me very carefully. Now, Paul was a healing apostle. He was an apostle being called with all the signs and wonders. And it just, you know, it just piques my curiosity why he just didn't heal him and pray for him. But here's a rather dramatic evidence that even before the death of the Apostle Paul, <coughs> excuse me, the apostolic gifts of healing and miracles, the signs of an apostle were beginning to cease or were no longer, uh, or had actually ceased, that's a, pro that's a possibility of it, or at least in the life of Paul, because it doesn't seem that if Paul was walking around with all these signs and wonders and powers, why he could not have prayed for a fellow servant who had been so faithful to him all this time. So it obviously wasn't the plan of God then, perhaps, to heal Trophimus, but Paul had not forsaken his dear friend either. He had not done that. Because in 2 Corinthians in chapter 12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. And yet, for whatever reason, whatever sovereign divine decision that was made on the by God through the life of Paul, he did not pray and see his friend healed. And then he also goes on to mention some faithful new friends that he, he acquired along the way in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. We know that to be true. In closing, Paul had sent greetings from, from a few believers in Rome who had not been scattered in the persecution. Right? We know that to be true. Um, in, in, in 2 Timothy 4.21 is where this comes out, and he's talking about um, uh, Eubelus greeted you as well as Prudence and Linus and Claudia and all the other brethren and God knows how many who these people were. We know nothing of these people but they furnished evidence. That for me is what's key here that even in his worst extremity the Apostle Paul's influence was still sufficiently powerful and active. Even in the worst kind of persecution people were still coming to Christ and Paul was still ministering to them. And finally, as we come to a close of leadership in this, in this class, you know, finally here was the sum of Paul's situation. He was, a, he, was, he was in this hole in the ground. Demas was gone. Crescens was ministering elsewhere. Titus was in Dalmatia ministering the word of God, which is modern-day Croatia and Albania. Tychicus had been sent to Ephesus to oversee the church there. Priscilla and Aquila, Onesiphorus and the family, and Erastus and Trophimus were all scattered, carrying on the work that Paul had begun that he had assigned to them. As he was going to death, he sends him out into the ministry field. Only Luke was still with the apostle. A few believers in the church of Rome also had lately befriended him. But he longed to see his son in the faith, Timothy, for one more time and to finish passing the baton of leadership. And he said in 2 Timothy 4.21, make every effort to come before winter. Do your utmost to come before winter. The appeal, the appeal is full of pathos and melancholy, even though Paul himself was triumphant. He knew the day of his departure was at hand. He understood that. Yet he also knew that if Timothy delayed, they never see each other face to face on earth again. And Paul still had much more in his heart to say. Thus the tender plea that sums up and ends this epistle when he says, make every effort to come before winter. Was Paul 
a failure as a leader? Not in the least. He was not a failure. His continuing influence in the lives of so many people give ample proof of the effectiveness of this leadership to the very end. He kept the faith. He fought the good fight. He had finished his course with joy. And that was the legacy in this life and through all of eternity as we conclude in this class that God is still in the business of raising leaders for his honor and for his glory.